places like the weapon storage area and the QRA had a uh, no warning necessary sh or kill zone shots. So if they made it over the fence, we was automatically allowed deadly force. So we didn't have to give any warnings. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Hello, Americans. At 7 o'clock this evening, Eastern Time, air and naval forces of the United States launched a series of strikes against the headquarters, terrorist facilities, and military assets that support Muammar Gaddafi's subversive activities. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. In this episode, we visit RAF Upper Hayford for a photography tour for Cold War enthusiasts. As you can imagine, this was right up my street. The episode is slightly different from the usual one. It's in three parts. The first is some audio from the tour, followed by an interview with Rick Batson, a former member of the US Air Force 20th Security Police Squadron and tour guide as well as an interview with his wife, who is also a tour guide and covers some aspects of the challenges of being the British wife of US Air Force service personnel. If you're enjoying the podcast, then from a few dollars, pounds or euros a month, you can help us cover our increasing costs and keep us on the air. You will also receive a Cold War Conversations coaster, this year's sought-after household Cold War accessory. Just go to coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option. Thank you so much to our current and latest patrons. I joined the Upper Hayford tour with my good friend Tim at the end of March 2019. The tour starts at the RAF Upper Hayford Heritage Centre with a short video and then you travel by minibus onto the base. The standard tour begins at 11am and lasts for approximately three hours. The guided tour concentrates on the US Air Force flying field and command operations during the height of the Cold War when RAF Upper Hayford was a target for Warsaw Pact forces. The first building we visited was the avionics maintenance facility which opened in 1981 for maintaining the F-111E terrain-following radar and other avionics. And the building was proof against a thousand-pound bomb with its own decontamination unit. It is only one of two such buildings in the UK and is a scheduled monument. It is a literally monumental structure, and we were so lucky to be able to go inside and see it. So we're in the avionics bunker here, which is a really atmospheric uh, place. Uh, there'll be photos on the show notes uh, about this, but there's some great artwork that uh, the U.S. Air Force have left behind in here. And it's just really creepy, to be honest. It's peeling paint and derelict um, a real relic of the Cold War that's sadly um, falling apart, but fascinating nonetheless. After our visit to the avionics bunker, we were back on the bus and moving further around the airfield. Aircraft were dispersed around the airfield and placed in shelters to protect them from the weather. These shelters were hardened with concrete to protect them against a direct hit from a 500-pound high-explosive bomb. And 56 of these hardened aircraft shelters were built at Upper Hayford and all remain. Two of these have been specifically designated for heritage use. These big buildings loomed across the entire base and we moved on to our next stop, which was nine of these hardened aircraft shelters, which formed the QRA or Quick Reaction Alert Area, where the Victor Alert Mission kept eight 
aircraft fueled and armed and ready for takeoff in less than 15 minutes. Here's a short excerpt with Rick describing some of the security procedures in the QRA area. On it, they would check to make sure you belong inside here. If you did not, you would find 26 armed security police pointing weapons at you. <laughs> Vehicles were thoroughly searched inside and out. Then you would be allowed to proceed inside. No matches or lighters were allowed inside, so you would have to give them up. The building right here is the alert facility. The pilots and crew chiefs got to sleep in there while they were here on site. The pilots worked a four day shift from th Sunday to Thursday or Thursday to Sunday where they lived there constantly. <coughs> the crew chiefs did a 30 day rotation in here, two days on, two days off. So for two days straight, they'd be in here, then they got to go home for two days and they came back. And they did that for 30 days. The cops got to go home every night, but then we was change weapons, so there's no argument. So if they got the call, how quickly could they deploy from here? Within four minutes they can take off. That's the fastest time they ever made. Only one of the hardened aircraft shelters still has operational doors and we were treated to the opening of one of these huge hangars. So I'm here in one of the locations where the F-111s would have been on standby for a four-minute scramble with nuclear weapons. You can probably hear the echoing acoustics around me. It's a really cavernous place um, with huge blast doors um, in front, uh, which have just been closed. You probably heard the alarm sound there. So we were soon back on the minibus again, off to another concrete structure. From 1970, three squadrons of F-111E strike aircraft were based at Upper Hayford, and they were joined by 13 EF-111A Ravens in 1985. All these units had their own headquarters buildings with a hardened side for protection against bombing and a decontamination unit. Rick stopped outside another huge concrete structure and gave us a description of what was inside. It's a shame because when this was built, the mission of Hayford changed from being a nuclear mission to a chemical, biological. So inside is a 100-man decontamination unit that's never been used. That's good. <laughs> When they built this and the British sent it over to the Americans, they said this was a nice building, but how do we get all the equipment in it? So they had to cut a hole in the wall <laughs> to get all their power plant stuff in. Inside here, it's divided into two sections. You have the soft shell and the hard shell. The soft shell is the day-to-day -day operation of the 42nd Squadron. They have the CO's office, the NCO's office, the bar. Every squadron had to have a bar. Then you have the hardened structure. The hardened structure is a mini command center. Inside you had life support. You had the ammunition unit. You had the map room, the briefing room, the safe that had all the classified materials in it. It had a data board of every single EF-111 and what the status of that aircraft was. And they were in constant communication with the main command center, which we'll be going into at the end of the tour. We were soon back on the bus again to uh, the area euphemistically called the Sophisticated Weapons Storage Area or Significant Weapons Storage Area, which to you and me is basically where the nuclear weapons are stored. Here's a short bit of audio. Well, the bomb sort of has a double fence around it, so again, deadly force is authorised. So surely that was a dead giveaway to any aerial reconnaissance that anything with double fence meant it yeah, was something important. The telephone poles you see inside the WSA would have cables running from pole to pole. It's basically to stop helicopters from landing. On leaving the weapons storage area, Rick then told us a spooky ghost story. There was an airman who committed suicide up there. Yeah. But 
down the fence line further on, you see a, there's a gate that goes from the outside to the inside that people used to come on base during rush hour traffic. And we have man, the guards down there. He was apparently stationed there when a girl on a horse walked up to him. And he started chatting to her and stuff, and then he made arrangements to go visit her when he got off. He went to the farmhouse that she said she lived at, and turned out she used to live there, but she had died two years earlier <laughs> from falling off of the horse at that gate. Oh. And the story is, is he was in that tower down there, and he came over the radio and said, she's here, she's coming to get me. By the time anyone got there, he was already dead. So, uh, the tour ends with a visit to the thousand pound bomb proof hardened command post, the highlight of the tour, where operational control of the aircraft and defence of the airbase from aerial attack was directed. Many of these rooms still contain their equipment, telephones, consoles and display screens. Here's Rick describing the main control area. Here shows the missions that this base or the command centre was run. It lists everything that anybody needed to know. It would have the aircraft's tail number, the mission it's going to, who was a pilot, who was a weapons officer, what time they were supposed to take off, and what time they actually took off, if there was anything wrong with the aircraft, and the destination. If you look at the top one, you have Colonel Bogo, who was one of the squadron commanders. He was actually supposed to take off at 7.30. He took off at 8.05, <coughs> so I guess rank have his privilege. He was actually going to Spain, which is the uh, initials and call signs on the side. If you go down to number 43, the, the aircraft was tail number 017. It, it had to be swapped out to 027 because there was a fuel leak, so they swapped out the aircraft. So they broke that down there so they knew what was going on. You have another one here that had flight control problems. Then you got Colonel Logger again, who goes flying. He probably built the same place, Spain. Probably was picking up Spanish beer. He loved it. But like I said, these are the last flights that this command center was used. So that would have been 86 most likely. Because in 1986, this base actually lost its flying mission, and the mission was taken over by Green and Common with the cruise missiles. So basically, this just became routine flying operations. The pit, like I said, each squadron had their own place. You got transportation, munitions. These were manned by personnel from each squadron, so you won't, you knew they knew their stuff. And, They'd be talking to their squad headquarters, like the security police one down there would be talking to the security police squad headquarters and keeping them up to par. All the information was then relayed to the wing commander so he can make his best move. So that basically ends the tour. This is the last part. Any questions? So, as Rick said, that was the end of the tour, but what you got there was only a snapshot of what the tour consists of. But I hope it whets your appetite as it is an amazing chance to visit a unique piece of the Cold War in the UK. If you'd like to book a tour, head over to upperhaifordheritage.co.uk. Links will be in the show notes. Now, don't go away. We have two interviews coming up, one with Rick talking about his time on the base as a security policeman and the other with his wife, Jo, talking about what life was like for the wives of servicemen. I start by asking Rick why he moved back to the UK. Um, actually, I went back to the States and finished off serving in the military in the States. And my wife got homesick, so we came back to the England. And you like it here, I take yeah, it? Yeah, I have no problem. It's the same at any old place. You can either like it or hate it. Yeah. That's what you can make of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're making a, a, a great thing do, doing these tours because it's absolutely brilliant having somebody who's actually served on the base giving you all, all the detail. And I did ask Rick loads of questions while I was on the tour, and he was uh, uh, very frank about li life on the base. But I wanted to ask you a few other questions. Um, when did you serve at Upper Hayford? Okay, I arrived here in January 94 or 84, 
and I left in January of 86, the day the Challenger broke up, uh, blew up. Right, so very memorable yeah. um, day. And, and what was your role within the 20th Security Police Squadron? Uh, I was a security specialist. I guarded the aircraft and the resources of the base uh, through different posts like the close-in sentry, uh, mobile patrol, fire team, entry control point. Right. And so so this was um, all the munitions and the aircraft themselves and the crews? Yes. I had nothing to do with the civilian side of the base or the law enforcement. Right, right. We carried bigger guns. <laughs> I was going to come on to armaments a little <laughs> bit later, so uh, save that one for me, Rick. Can, how, can you describe your training? I mean, how, how were you trained for that role? Um, basically, after basic training, you went to the Security Police Academy in Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, and did eight weeks. And then you went to Camp Bolas, which is an Army base, and did eight weeks air base ground defense training. Basically, it was the infantry training. And then you was allowed to go overseas afterwards. Right, right. And it, was the training pretty similar to regular infantry training or um, yeah is... we did we learned how to dig fox hose set up booby traps uh do patrolling how to use i'll call it an artillery if we needed to be and um map reading and just basically the infantry of the air because the air the security specialist is the infantry of the air force right it's like the rf regiment you did everything. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So, yeah. so it's it's almost exactly the same as the RAF regiment in yeah, the well, UK. Yeah, pretty much similar to it. Yeah. Okay. And before you arrived in the UK, what did the US military tell you about the UK? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Come on, they must <laughs> no. have told you something. We didn't. You didn't know anything about the base until you arrived, and then during your end processing, they gave you these little notebooks of British life. Right. Uh, the different meanings of words. Oh, like, I'd love to see one of those. Uh, so I they, don't have mine. Oh, sorry. okay. So, so did they warn you about warm beer and driving on the left? And Yeah, because um, even though we had American vehicles here, we still drove on the left-hand side. Right, even so, on the base? Yeah, even on the base. Oh, okay. So that way you got used to driving, so you didn't have to swap over left or right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, what about fraternizing with the locals? You're obviously successful there. Yes, I did, <laughs> since I married one of them. Um, there was basically no policy about not fraternizing. They actually encouraged to get out to meet the people, to get a friendly, I don't know what you want to call it, um, community relations and stuff. Because we are foreigners to a world country, and our aircraft did make a lot of noise. Yeah. So yeah. we try to make the locals friendly with us and stuff. Yeah, we didn't want yeah. to upset them. But you were also a huge local employer as well, weren't you? Yeah, we had. You figured this base had roughly any place from ten to 12,000 servicemen and probably another five to 6,000 civilian employees. Some of them was wives and husbands of military serving members, but a lot of them was British nationals. Right, right. And so what was a regular service day for, like, you know, like for you? It depends what shift I was on. Um, because I was a security specialist, I basically was assigned to evening shifts and mid shifts. So I did three evenings and three mids before I had three days off. So basically, my life would get up, go to the dining hall, eat breakfast, then get dressed and go to work. Yeah. And then get off at some out ridiculous hour. Right, right. Either go back to the dining hall for a late breakfast or late lunch or go to the bowling alley yeah where, which was open 24 hours a day and then go to bed <laughs> sounds like a tough gig rick <laughs> it's not really that tough a lot of it's just you get routines um i mean if you're doing it if you're doing a mid you could get up about 12 maybe three o'clock in the afternoon after you slept mm. then you just go to the bx go to the rec center or watch the TV, and then you got ready when it's time to come in to, at midnight to go to work. Yeah, and and as far as the work was concerned, what were you doing? Were you on foot patrols, and it, what what was that? It depends what shift you were. Because what it is is you go, I go into work, check the duty roster, and find out which post I had, and that would tell me if I was a vehicle patrol, mobile patrol, and it would also tell you what weapon to draw. 
So sometimes you come in and you'll be a close-in sentry, which is a foot patrol guarding the uh, QIA. Mm-hmm. Or you could come in and be an art team or a SART team, which is a two-man patrol, or a fire team, which is a four-man armored personnel carrier. Right, right. Well, I was going to come on to that. So so what sort of armaments were, were you using? Um, but our basic thing is a M16 with 240 rounds, or you could be assigned as a grenader or gunner, and you had um, an M203, which you would carry the basically is a grenade launcher attached to an M16. So you have the 240 rounds for the M16 plus 40 grenades. Or you can be a M16 or M60 gunner, which is a fully automatic weapon, and you carry 1,200 rounds with that. Right, right. And the vehicles that you were using, I mean, you mentioned armor personnel carrier. Yeah, you had the Commando Ranger armor personnel carrier, which we called Peacekeepers. And then we had the pickup trucks that we drove, which I won't say the word what we call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a family show, Rick. We have to uh, we, we have to be careful. So, what what was life like living on the base? It basically was just like living in the states. I mean, we had everything here that you could get in the states. The BX sold American clothing, American products. The commissary sold American foods. Uh, our Class 6 licensed store sold American dr- booze, so you can get your favorite beer from the States. So it basically was another, could have been claimed, classified as another city of the America. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only difference is when you came in contact with the locals and the accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you struggle with the English accent to start with? Uh, not much. I mean, I picked up a lot of it. But then again, America has different accents depending on what part of the state you're from. Um, I know when I first met my wife, she had a broad Derbyshire accent. I had a heck of a time understanding what she (laughs) said. You had to work with the MOD police, the Ministry of Defense, the British Ministry of Defense police. What what was that like? Uh, They were really a bunch of nice guys. There were five of them here, a sergeant and four constables. And they basically dealt with any civilian matters that did with the British public or the, they dealt with the c and where we could not intervene unless we were deputized by them first. Right. So we got along with them. I mean, we met with them over at the British canteen, had tea with them and breakfast with them. So. Yeah. And and there was a, a C&D peace camp was on the site when you were serving? Yeah, just outside Gate 7. Um, it wasn't as popular as it was when the Americans first brought them, came over here. So they just had the diehard locals that really wanted to protest. Yeah. But they really wasn't that much problems. I mean, when I was stationed here, they, they only got on the base twice, but they didn't do any damage or anything. Right, right. So you didn't have any direct interaction with them. It was the MOD. Yeah, basically it's the MOD, unless we got deputized, then all we could do was cuff them and take them someplace else. Right, right. Um, I've read about some of the exercises. I read about one called Autumn Tiger, which I think was after you were yeah, was, you were here. But can you describe some of the exercises and what they were designed to you know test um, you in? Well, basically, when I was here, the only exercise that I participated in is was our inspections. We had the OII, which is a operational ready inspection just to see if we was ready to capable of taking and launching our aircraft off within a certain time frame. And they would pull exercises like uh, intruder coming on base and uh, an aircraft landing unannounced on the flight line, and we had to surround it and identify, making sure it was a qualified aircraft. Then we had our NATO TACA vows when we had inspectors from all the NATO countries come in, and they would have a different scenario for us to do and everything else. And then we just had our regular exercises that either our squadron did or the wing commander himself did yeah. just to see how ready us we were and if we yeah. could defend the base. Because in, in the Autumn Tiger one I was reading about, there were there were two levels of threat they were trying to train against there. One Level one was classified as sleeper agents, sympathizers, partisans, and terrorists. Um, and level two with special forces, which I presume is Spetsnats or, or something. Yeah, uh, we did. I know when I was stationed here, we did have a team that trained with the British SAS, 
where the SAS portrayed to be uh, intruders and trying to get on the base and to set off a flare at a certain location. And they made it in, but they didn't make it out. (laughs) (laughs) So after they set off the flare, we got them. Yeah. But um, there really wasn't that many exercises or things except the day-to-day things that we did normally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what were your instructions if somebody entered the base illegally? It depends what part of the base they were intruder on. If it's the general location on the flight line or any place that did not have top secret material or weapons, uh, we had to give them a warning. Um, places like the weapons storage area and the QRA had a uh, no warning necessary sh- or kill zone shots. So if they made it over the fence, we was automatically allowed deadly th- force. So we didn't have to give any warnings. Right. But any place else, we had to give them the proper warnings, hold our, or our fire. And we normally said that three times before we could actually fire a right. bottle. And, and it was a shoot to kill rather than shoot over um, the head? So yes. Yeah. If, it, if it pertained to anything classified or restricted, we had shoot to kill. All the others, we could either give a warning shot or we could shoot right. at them. Right. So, Wow. Well, hell of a responsibility. It is when you're 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I can't, can't, imagine, um, can't imagine that at all. What incidents stand out during your service at Upper Hayford, or what was the most surprising thing you experienced or saw while you were serving? Um, surprising. Having a bomb threat at the security police dormitory <laughs> during my anniversary or my <laughs> honeymoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing really outstands. I mean, things. I do have memories of Hayford. I mean, like during one Tacaval, a NATO Tacaval, uh, a German inspector came up to me when I was a gunner on the APC and told me my sixty just jammed. How was I going to defend myself? And I pulled my thirty eight out. And then he said, "Well, you just ran me off of your last ammo. How you don't defend yourself now?" And I started pulling knives out. Because <laughs> I had a habit of carrying three or four knives on me, which yeah. wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, and he just turned around and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we did have fun here. I mean, it's not all uh, practicing for war or anything. Yeah, I mean, it, it's different because Hayford, being in a foreign country, Hayford shut down at four o'clock or four thirty Friday. So the only people that was over on the weekend was maintenance fixing aircraft or the police. So we pretty much had the whole flight line for ourselves. Right. I mean, and we goofed off a lot. I mean, during the winter time, we used to put the sl- uh, food trays on the ground and sl- hang onto the vehicles and ice skate. <laughs> <laughs> or we played flag football. Flight football. Yeah, it's yeah. American-style football, but instead of tackling, you just put some flags on, you rip the flags off the people. Oh, okay. Oh, a bit like tag rugby, yeah. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we had fun here because it was you were in a foreign world, so you stayed together and you had your own get-togethers and stuff, yeah. which was different back in the States. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing those memories. Um, with some of my guests, I do ask a few extra questions. They're a bit, little bit more fun okay. than maybe what I've asked so far. So I just want to know, what's your favorite Cold War era film? I like a lot of war films, and they're all Cold War. I mean, the Korean War the ones are Cold War. The Vietnam's Cold War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. But I do like the Strategic Air Command with Jimmy Stewart. It's Strategic Air yeah, Command, with yeah. Jimmy Stewart, yeah. Where, yeah. They, where SAC came about. Yeah. Because I was a SAC cop before I came over here. Right. Oh, so okay. I, I did walk around B-52s and did deal with them. Yeah, yeah. So That's a great a nice... early color film as well, Yeah, it's a technical. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, good choice, good choice. Have you got any Cold War items that you've retained as souvenirs? No, I didn't. I didn't save anything. Not a few patches or things like that? I'm not suggesting you've got an M16. No, I mean, somewhere. I got a squadron jacket that w- we had f- from the 20th Security Police. And then the patches I'm wearing on my uniform now are my original patches. Yeah. Just on a different size uniform. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can you recommend any film or TV series that you think would be a good representation of life at Upper Hayford? Well, there's one called Gathering of Eagles. It's basically a movie with Rock Hudson in it that deals with the operational readiness inspections right. and what people go through to get ready for them and yeah. what it affects if you fail them. So that's a good movie. Okay, Gathering of Eagles. I've not heard of that one, so I will uh, hunt that down. Rick, that has been... Fantastic. I've right. really appreciated this afternoon or this Thank morning you. and this afternoon. Yes, I mean, it was a long day. It was it was a, a long day, huge amount. We of actually went into places we normally don't take people. Well, I, I, I feel honored to have not only spoken to you, but the fact that we went to, you know, places that people don't don't often go to. Next up was Joe, Rick's wife. While we were on the tour, Joe told us about what, what life is like as uh, the wife of uh, somebody working in in the U.S. Air Force on on the base, and you told me a story um, about a time of the um, the bombing of Libya in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, um, it was just a thing that my husband would definitely be going, and we were very young. I was eighteen. We just got married, starting off, and the next thing we know, someone's saying, "Oh, we're going, we're going," and I said, "How will I know if you're actually going? Whether it's an exercise." And he said, look out of the window, if you can see a cargo plane, it means I've gone. And of course, later on, I'm looking out of the window and there was a cargo plane. <laughs> so I just burst into tears. I, it, I was bereft. It was mm. really awful at the time. I can laugh about it now. <laughs> um, and then, of course, later on, he showed up. And by the time he got home, I just puffy cheeks, tear stained, big bloodshot eyes. And he just looked at me and said, what? It was an exercise. So what was his story about the cargo plane then? He, he... Well, he, he, I don't know if you talked to him about it, because while he was on that cargo plane, he was a, he was a sergeant, I think, at the time. Mm. And um, he had a couple of young guys who were petrified. And he said, don't worry. And they were sitting on the plane. He said, it's probably an exercise. You don't need to worry unless they start giving out the ammunition. And they started to give out the ammunition. Oh, no. So, so they thought they were going as well. Yeah. And then they turned around and said, okay, it's an exercise. Go home. Was Rick away often or was he... When we were here, we, yeah. were, we were only here together for a short length of time. Uh, so, no, most of the time he was... Um, I mean, he worked quite long shifts sometimes. Um, but he was around a lot yeah. until... There was this thing with Libya and everyone was doing exercises, not just the cops, but a lot of other people. So yeah. there was a lot of people gone quite a bit. But it wasn't until we moved to the States right, that right. he was gone a lot. Oh, so. and, and you were in a completely different country and getting to grips yes. with that. Yes. Was that. Was that quite tough? Yeah, I, I have the greatest respect for the wives and husbands of serving people not just the americans but mm. everybody i don't know how they did it i just fell apart i could not do it yeah <laughs> it was awful for me yeah um i mean i was told things like like my mother-in-law said don't worry you'll go and there'll be an english wives club and you'll be able to get you know acclimated that way yeah. so i went there and i said oh do you have an english wives club and they just look at me like i was an alien and said no <laughs> so i was like where do i go now yeah and we got... had the baby as well. We had a little baby. Oh, my goodness. She's 32 now. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. okay. But, yeah, that must have been a real um, challenge for you. Yeah. 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 But you you told me a lovely story about how you met. Yes, we were pen pals. Uh, my cousin and I, um, I can't remember how, but we managed to get hold of the Stars and Stripes newspaper, and they put an ad in for pen yeah. pals for us. So that's the military... The US, the US military, military newspaper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we got inundated and then we narrowed it down to nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to keep your options open, don't you? <laughs> well, it was just to be friends. <laughs> I know, to I be know. Fair. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, we had friends in Germany and uh, oh, I can't remember where else now. And um, yeah, so Rick was the only one that was stationed over here. Yeah. So and then my cousin got ill. So I ended up with nine pen pals. And once I met Rick, it was like, you know, soulmates, actually. We've been yeah. together for 33 years now. But uh, tell me about, well, tell me about the phone. Tell the, the audience phone about the call. phone call. 
Yes. Um, I can remember being in my room and the phone rang and my mum answered and she called up for me and she went, I think it's Richard. Well, I didn't know anyone called Richard because yeah. I knew him as Rick. Yeah. So I thought, I wonder who that can be. And, and he just said, hi, do you know who it is? And I, I was very nervous. I said, is it Rick? He said, yes, I'm at McDonald's in Derby. And there was only one. <laughs> and the ultimate romantic location. Absolutely. So I went down there and you could drive past it as well. You can't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he didn't tell me he'd brought a friend with him. And he, he sat with his back to the door. So I was outside looking through the windows looking for him. Yeah. So you you presumably as he sent you a photo. So we you had have, photographs. Right, we had exchanged okay. photographs. Yeah. yeah. Um, but other than that, no. So yeah, looking. Yeah. And of course, he wasn't in a uniform. The pictures I had is in uniform. Right. He turned around, and I recognised his sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> there you That's go. brilliant. That's and his face, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, was yeah, his yeah. sunglasses that yeah. tipped me off. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, you. You went back to this location this week, McDonald's, Yesterday. Yesterday. to <laughs> celebrate your 32nd anniversary. Selfies are awful. <laughs> oh, they're brilliant. They're brilliant. Um, yes, outside the very same McDonald's, although it has obviously changed a lot over the years. Yeah, but, but it's yeah. still a McDonald's. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Same place. Yeah. Brilliant. That is a lovely story, Joe. I'm glad and, you think so. Well, no, it, it is. It, I, I mean, it, it is. It's part, it's, it's part of the Cold War you know, okay, I, I do a podcast called Cold War Conversations, but I I want all the stories out there. It's not all about fast jets and tanks and stuff like that. It's about people's personal experiences as well. Well, Joe, I've taken enough of your time, and especially a with a four hour plus tour that we um, that we had today. I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate you sharing your stories. Thank you very much You're for coming welcome. on Cold War Conversations. Well, that's it for this episode. However, there are lots of photos in the show notes, which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 65. Don't forget, you can support us and get a Cold War Conversations coaster at patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash cold war pod if you like what you are hearing in the podcast you can really help us as well by leaving reviews on itunes stitcher our facebook page or with your favorite podcast provider this really helps to raise our profile and get new guests on the show if you can't wait for the next episode do visit our facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod and Instagram at Cold War Conversations. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.